Charles Kong. Um, and can we give everyone a applause? She's going to talk a little bit <laughs> about the book, and then uh, she's going to launch the book along with you. Um, and then she's going to talk to us after. Yeah? Okay, so if you're local, or even if you're not local, if you're a woman here, you're thinking in going to politics. Which I'm thinking of doing. <laughs> so, uh, guys, ask your questions for her. She's here for that. So I'm going to read a little bit about you. You all have it on your seat. Trying to not to use that. You can use that. I think it's necessary for the guy who wants us to use it. <laughs> so, now, uh, She's currently uh, serving a uh, first time as a CD for the Carbon Mono and Constituency in the old era after being elected on a first time running in February 2016. She has since been appointed to the front bench as for passing for Heart and Heritage for uh, 24 leader Michael Martin T. D. Uh, Deputy Smith. Uh, he's also the president of the Finnefall Women Network uh, and runs regular events at Linkston House. So if any of us is thinking of going to Linkston, if you have an organization and you're thinking of going and you're looking for somebody to host you, she could host you. Yes. So yet today, guys, she can host you guys there. So uh, put that in your diary. Uh, sorry. <laughs> yeah. Um, yeah. Okay, so she's also the president of the Pinnacle Women Network and runs a regular event at the Lister House as part of our role. Neve is a board member of the Carbon Monument Education and Training Board, Economic Social and Development Forum, Carbon County, uh, Bali Bay Community Schools, just which Virginia uh, Vacation School. So she's, uh, she's now elected as a member of the Carbon County Council for two times, and in her last uh, local election, she tapped into the poll with 1,800 votes in the county council, which was an excellent vote. Uh, uh, so she's here today with us to launch Pamela's book. And she's here also to tell us a little bit about how it is for women going into politics. So as women, if you're thinking, what is the next phase of my career? What should I do next? But what is it for me as a migrant? Is there a place for me within the county, uh, within the uh, political world? She's telling you, there is a place for you, <coughs> for me and for you. So let's listen to her and enjoy. So thank you very much for coming. Uh, good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. And firstly, can I thank the organisation for inviting me here today and to the very privileged job and honour of uh, launching this fabulous book, which I really look forward to reading. Um, I was asked to talk a little bit about the role of women in politics, and I suppose I thought the best way to do that might be to speak about my own personal journey, which has been um, spanned over the last seven years. Well, it's a little bit longer than that now. Um, we're, we're almost at a decade, but it's been a, an adventure, and it certainly wasn't something I ever thought of for myself when I was in school or when I was in college. And it is quite amazing how life takes its twists and turns and you can end up in something that you might have never perceived yourself to be uh, as a young woman. And I went, I'm from the county, and firstly can I say to the ladies and gentlemen who are visiting Ireland for the very first time, you're very welcome and you're very welcome to County Cabin as well. And for those of you who are living in our community here in Cabin Town, and perhaps far beyond Cabot Town, but within the county. Uh, I do hope you are feeling embraced, that you're feeling loved, and that you're feeling very much included uh, of our, as part of our community uh, here in County Cabot. So my own personal journey, I went to school in a local community school in Bavra, and from there I went to Art College, no less. And uh, for me, Art College was in the National College of Art and Design, which is in Dublin. And there I followed a career in education, which was to become a secondary school art teacher and also studying uh, history of art and fine art, painting as my major study. So I spent four years in NCAD and when I was finished that degree, I taught in some primary schools, secondary schools and further education settings in Dublin. And my very first teaching job was in Ballyfermot in County Dublin. Uh, and if anybody knows Ballyfermot, they know that it is a wonderful community made of wonderful people uh, who certainly haven't had it easy for some in life. 
Uh, and it was probably the best training ground I ever got in terms of teaching because it's like anything. You can spend years doing the books and you can spend years learning the theory of the practice of whatever it is you're going to do in life. But for me, the experience of teaching was always where I got my real, I suppose, training and, and sense of where education and young people are at. So I taught in Dublin for a couple of years, taught in the secondary school in Walkinstown, and when I did done that, uh, I went to the um, Dublin IT to do a Master's in Curatorial Studies. So that was kind of going back to the art uh, side of me, where I was working mainly with artists and curating exhibitions for artists from both Belfast and Dublin and all over the country. Uh, so I worked for some time as a practicing artist, making paintings, making textiles, making contemporary practice uh, for a number of years when I moved back to Cabot. Uh, I worked closely with Cabot County Council and got more involved in both my own community in that line of work. And at that point I had a small art space uh, in Baylor, which was an old Methodist church. And my mum is here with me today and she had the foresight long before I could even uh, visualize perhaps having an art center. And I have to say at that time, that's only 20 years ago, that was very much unheard of to hear of an art space, and particularly an independent art space with no funding from anywhere other than what you could create yourself. Uh, it was quite the unusual more than the norm. Uh, so perhaps that's where I got my inspiration from. So uh, working in the Wesleyan Chapel as an independent artist and work, being part and back living in my community certainly was part of my inspiration uh, in terms of going for a career in politics. And of course, when you're living in your community, the most important thing for anybody in a community is to get involved, which isn't always easy. You perhaps need um, a love of maybe gardening to get involved with tiny towns, or maybe you're concerned about cr crime in your area, so that maybe draws you into community alert. But whatever it is, or perhaps it's just wanting to bring, I suppose, some um, embracement into your community and you get involved in a festival activity, whatever your purpose for getting involved, the whole most important uh, thing to do is to get involved. And for me, uh, getting involved <coughs> wasn't hard. It was kind of just something I felt to grow or a natural love of doing and being involved and being involved in community groups and helping where I could help. And I suppose that led me on very easily then to a career in politics. Um, for me, Fianna Fáil was the party that my family were associated and my grand uncle was Paddy Smith. Uh, and there's a house not far from here, just down on Church Street here, which is uh, in honour of his um, contribution and the, I suppose, the significant role he played in politics, both nationally and obviously here in County Cavan. And he still to this day holds the record of the longest serving TD, or Chapazola, uh, our Irish term for it, uh, in the country. So um, I have to say his career spanned over 54 years and I doubt, undoubtedly I'm not had that long in politics myself, but um, and I can't honestly say that uh, I remember his, his career in politics or I wasn't really around when I was a fairly child when he was involved in politics. They say it's your blood, I'm not so sure. I think anybody who has a passion for the community, anybody who has a passion for um, being involved, anybody who has a passion for their county, uh, politics is certainly one way to fulfil that passion. And I would say, as was alluded to here, we're not that far from the local elections, ladies and gentlemen. And if anybody is thinking of putting themselves forward, now is the time to be thinking about it. And if you're involved in your community alert, or if you're involved in tiny towns, or if you're involved in festivals, or wonderful conferences like this, it is certainly not something that is beyond anybody's reach. And for me, uh, being a female politician has been most fulfilling. It has been um, a wonderful way to meet very interesting people, both male and female. Um, it's not, I suppose, we're certainly a, a long way off from having balance in terms of the number of women involved in politics. Uh, we uh, do hold 51% of the population across Ireland. Uh, but unfortunately, we're not reaching the same target when it comes to the number of women involved in politics, both locally and nationally. So if anybody is here thinking of putting themselves forward, the very best of luck to you. And don't ever think it's beyond the realms of possibility. It's about thinking about it, it's about being involved in your community, and certainly I would say it's the most fulfilling job. It is tough, but as I say, there's no job anymore that isn't tough. Um, as I said, my, my career before this was in education and teaching and, you know, I think anything that you do in life that you give your heart and soul to is never going to be easy. You know, it's not the easy route to take. Uh, and if it was the easy route, everybody would be doing it. A wise man said to me one day. So
So don't ever let, let it put you up thinking that it's tough. It's like I say, every job is tough if you're putting your heart and soul into it. And I can say, from the bottom of my heart, I do love my job. And I'm here to serve yourselves and everybody else within your community uh, and within the county. And I'm here in Cabin Town, in Paddy Smith House in Church Street here, every Friday. If anyone has any problems, concerns, worries, please feel free to call in to me. And at that, I'll say, we're me and me the Invite our Brian in the house to do the book. Yes. Um, can I help? Now, before we do that, uh, Brian, you're complaining about the volume. What do you want us to do? Is it okay now? We need, I need it. Everybody needs it. Good. Keep the microphone direct in all the time. Okay, Brian. You're right at the ball. That's much better, isn't it? <laughs> Yeah, perfect, perfect. Okay, so, Camilla, I'm going to invite you up. Hello. Please come on ahead. Hello. 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 Um, we're going to go over there okay. uh, to where the books are there. Yes. We stand behind the books, of course. The books have to take center stage along with Pamela. And her book is called Loving the Brother. And the first thing that struck me when I walked into the room, actually, the first thing that struck me when I walked into the room, I saw the beautiful book. Um, Jean Marie, do you want to come and join us, please? Come and join. <laughs> it's a beautiful picture on the front. And I would always say a picture um, can speak a thousand words, and it certainly does. Okay. So yes, um, I have to say I haven't read the book as yet, but I certainly look forward to it. And the other thing I'd like to do, of course, we can't go without the author having signed the book and everybody else involved. I think that's very important. Yeah, yeah. And for anybody who's here today, make sure you all queue up and, of course, to buy as many copies as possible. Would you agree, ladies? Yeah. I think that's very, very important. But, I mean, it is a huge thing to produce a book, to write a book, and to share your thoughts and share your experiences with the whole wide world, which is what you are doing. Uh, in this book here today and I just want to say that it gives me great, great pleasure to officially launch The Loving Brothers. Give her a hand. Yeah. So the book is now today, Island. Um, yeah, uh, it's launched today in Ireland. Uh, this is so you've launched it in um, UK, so this yeah. is another country that you're launching it. Hello everybody, it's a good evening. Um, I want to give ourselves a round of applause for all the women in the house. is in the shadow of your wings. It talks about uh, how much people try to limit us and even under the shadow of God's wings that uh, anything is possible. Even as the world tries to limit people in this world and especially women that under the shadow of God's wings anything is possible. In the shadow of your wings I know I am in the shadow of your I find relief for you hold me and you guide me with your righteous hand I find the rest peace and mind in the shadow of I 
in times of distress, confusion and fear, when my enemy surrounds me, Father, I know with you I'm safe, cause you keep me and I be in the shadow of your wings. In the shadow of your wings, I know I am safe. In the shadow of your wings, I find relief. For you to hold me and you guide me.
The meeting is also responsible for the, uh, the rural newsletter uh, updating their website, social media. She's involved in the new EU IOZ in 2020 for this project. Um, and that is part of the reason I'm working and now we're going to see what we can get, hopefully. We'll get something nice, um, which is called the replicable modern business model for the rural economy, in which they partner with 15 other organizations across the 11 EU countries. Louise also coordinates the National Mill and World Network and previously the Community Westland Forum. With this, we can see she has a hands full. So she has a lot she's doing and then she still makes time to be here. Thank you very much. And if you were there in the beginning, I talk about what this project, what we're planning to do with this project, uh, which is called the REN. So the REN is about the rural uh, we're going to be working with women within the rural community so that are thinking of going into businesses. But we're actually going to focus more on ethnic women looking for funding, looking for opportunities to, work, uh, to, to develop their businesses within uh, the rural of Ireland. And that is part of the region she's here to give, to, to, to talk to us today. So thank you very much. I need you guys to please keep quiet and listen. You will do all your talk after 8 o'clock, ladies. Yeah, thank you very much for coming. Yeah, okay. Do you want to? Yeah. So please, let's have some silent moms and daddy in the house. Good afternoon, everyone, and um, I'm delighted to be here today speaking to you, and I'd like to thank Susanna um, for inviting me to speak. Um, I suppose we met Susanna as we had our annual conference in a few months ago and Susanna attended it and it was great to meet her and she actually contributed really well to the uh, to the discussion that was taking place and to the workshops also. Um, so I suppose just to give a brief uh, outline of what I just covered today in my presentation. So I'll just give an overview of what Irish Rural League does and kind of some of the core work we do and the networks we, we represent and work with. Um, I'm, Susanna asked me as well to just give a bit about kind of the advantages of living in rural areas. And I suppose over the last few years there has been a lot of a maybe bad press, so to speak, or that it's rural Ireland is dead and gone, but it's still very much alive. So I'll give some of the advantages of what's there and also the opportunities that are there for people living in rural areas, but also the challenges um, for people living in rural Ireland as well, and for people who are trying to set up a business and trying to work in and raise a family and make a livelihood in rural areas. And um, I'll just go through some of the government policies and um, on rural development, and also maybe some of the funding streams that can be um, maybe tapped into for me, and then I'll go through some of the current projects we're involved in that will be relevant to a lot of you here today. So just a bit about Irish Rural Inc. I suppose we represent the interests of locally based rural groups in disadvantaged and marginalised rural areas and highlight the problems um, that they face but also advocating these problems and, and share the experience, but also uh, coming up with solutions to any of the problems that people may face in rural areas. I suppose you were to ask in three words what Irish Rural Link are about, about sustainable rural development and sustainable rural communities. So um, that's made the, the essence of, of the work we do, and that's kind of our ethos as well, and any of the projects that we've worked on and any of the work we're involved in and the, the community groups are, are members are we have over 600 uh, members community groups that are dedicated to sustainable rural development and and working with marginalized groups as well and we also we represent those rural communities on at a national and at european level also I suppose our main vision is for um, a vibrant, inclusive and sustainable rural communities that contribute to an equitable and just society so that rural areas and 
all policies that are in, inclusive of everyone living in, in, in rural areas. And our mission is to influence and inform local, regional, national, and European uh, development policies and programs in favour of rural communities, uh, especially those who are marginalised as a result of poverty or social exclusion. So, um, we're Irish Rural Link are one of 17 national members, um, community and voluntary um, organisations that formed the Community and Voluntary Pillar, which is nominated by government as um, an advocate source with rights to participate in the social uh, dialogue process. So we, um, we have bilateral meetings with a lot of the government departments on a regular basis. So, and we can bring to the table then any of the issues that are being, are, like our rural link would bring any of the rural issues that communities are facing and our members are facing on a, on a regular at the moment, but also kind of bring solutions as well to the to the table. Most of our work as well is advocacy work as um, Susanna mentioned that um, we write, write submissions and put proposals um, to government and to other government departments as well and also we're often called on to give advice to government on, on if a situation arises, what, how best maybe to, what solutions are out there or how best to, to tackle that. The most, a lot of the main um, issues that we do um, talk about are the rural transport services in rural areas, both broadband is a big one, and um, infrastructure also and income in um, rural areas, I suppose, and creation of jobs. Um, so we also sit on um, various government committees. We sit on the Farm Safety Committee, and um, also the Monitoring Committee for the Action Plan for Development on Water Quality and also on cross-border programmes. So I suppose, uh, as Susanna mentioned as well, um, we work with uh, some of the networks and some of the networks have formed under our umbrella. Um, so like we try to encourage our members to form networks together so that they can come together like the, the Renan network is doing and um, forming that space, I suppose, to discuss ideas, discuss any issues that might be, might have also um, learn from each other and learn about best practice, you know, like if something is working for one group, maybe it could work in another area as well with that group. So it gives that, like, that space for them to give, make that discussion. So um, we work with the Means and Reads Network that was formed. The Means and Reads, as you know, it's a worldwide um, service. It's providing means mainly to older people that may not have they may no longer be able to um, cook for themselves, but are not, I suppose, helping them keep them in their home for as long as possible. And it's a valuable service, especially for a lot of people in rural areas, old people who may be living on their own, where the family might have moved away and there's no one to cook for them. And they are the, the, sometimes the first point of contact, or maybe the only point of contact a person might have is that delivery of me every, on a daily basis. The Community Wetlands Forum, this was set up in 2013 and again it was some of our members were involved in, it was the turf cutting, the, the bogs were no longer, there were, there were designated um, sites and um, so they were no longer uh, used to cut, cut turf on. Um, so instead of having them as kind of like a waste wasteland, as a dumping ground, community groups came together, engaged with local communities, and engaged with the rest of the communities, and brought them on to kind of, they're like amenities now for local areas. A lot of them have um, like a boardwalk on it, so you can go out and you can experience the, like nature, it's uh, preserving the species and wildlife. In, on the ball as well, so it's bringing in that health and well-being, I suppose, and um, having that space for maybe families to go for walks and 
and even learn about nature and appreciate, I suppose, nature and, and the, the value of land and, and the value of, of their local environment and local heritage. The Rural Transport Network, we work with them and support their local link companies. I'm not sure if some of you might have seen local link buses um, around the town. I know the cabin on in local link is, is quite active in, in around here. So it um, and it's providing public transport in rural areas. So that's being developed or it's developing and growing all the time. So we kind of help and advocate for that to more investment to be put in, in into those services. So I suppose the advantages of living in rural areas, as I mentioned a lot of the time, you get the bad press and the bad but rural villages are dead and um, shops are closing down everywhere. There's post offices closing down and no transport. But there are a lot of advantages for living in rural areas. And I suppose I picked this picture because it's nice and bright. I suppose it highlights the green fields and even the colourful um, the colourful houses and, and shop fronts that you can see a lot around a lot of Irish villages and towns. But also um, it's quietness as well that can be an advantage for a lot of people. Um, you know, they get away from the hustle and bustle. And Susanna had mentioned as well the education system in Ireland and it is very much a universal for everyone and, and there's no class and um, there's you know a class division within um, the Irish school system and I, it, that's even more true in rural areas. The classes are a lot smaller and there's you know the, everyone knows everyone and um, all the children would know everyone even in the school. So it is a nice and it's that community feeling that you get. Um, I suppose when your kids are in school and in a small school, you, you do get to know everyone if you're new to an area. And it is, gives that more welcoming sense that um, you can get, um, well, that you might not feel like in bigger towns or in cities. Um, as also, another advantage is the local community, you know, it is friendlier. I, I hope everyone is so I recommend they join uh, to move to a new area and um, it is that you know sense of belonging I suppose and being able to get involved with the community and, and you know that it, it, everyone knows everyone and, and people will be there to help you as well I think if there is difficulties. Yeah so what we are trying to say is that this uh, for uh, this uh, summit is about encouraging us as women that are working uh, that there's an opportunity for you to live within the rural environment. The grains are very cheap, very reasonable, so and it's easy. The roads are very good, so you can easily travel. I know it might be a long distance, but when you're paying lower rent, you have a good environment to be able to live and nourish. You have love, uh, people around you that would love and care for you. So today we're trying to encourage us as uh, migrant women that we shouldn't just focus on living in Dublin or anything. We're trying to say move out, move within the rural environment within Ireland, and then you have some money left in your pocket to be able to spend. And it's a good advantage. Uh, so thank you very much. I'm not keeping you, I'm not handing that uh, job. We, we are going to ask them more questions. Uh, but I want to give our keynote speaker an opportunity as well to uh, talk and then get, uh, and then we can ask, she's with us, so we can ask her questions after all. Yeah? Uh, you want to do your last slide? Yeah. Uh, yeah? Uh, the funding part of it. Uh, so this is important for organizations that are here, and that's part of the reason she's here today. Um, this is part of the project we are going to be doing with her, and basically we're thinking of working with women within the rural. But our focus, and I know sometimes people say, why do you focus mostly on your own community? Because that is who I am anyway. There's a lot of other people focusing within the Irish community itself. So somebody should focus on our own community, and uh, we, they're going to be working with us to be able to achieve that. So all right. Yeah. So this is one of the European projects we're involved in. It's um, micro, it's enhancing competitive, competitiveness of micro enterprises in rural areas. So I suppose uh, over 92% of enterprises in rural areas are micro, meaning that they're one to ten employees, 
and that's replicated across Europe as well. So what Micro is, has done, it has developed open educational resources, so it's targeted the micro and craft type enterprises in rural areas. So there's 10 modules there and you can access them on the website. It's microsmetraining.eu and they're easily accessible and available for free as well. So it'll help enhance your business and even making use of, of the EU market as well. It's single market, so um, you're, you're not paying any tariffs or anything. So, um, make new, more use of that and one of the there's it's seven partners so we're involved with the spanish italian um macedonian greece and belgian and also the university are involved with us in it as well another um project we're involved in it's a cross-border project it's the next chapter project and as the as deputy smith has alluded to earlier the local elections are coming up so this project is aimed at, at increasing and improving the representation of women in the community, in public life and in, in political life as well, and have that more, like contribute to the gender sensitive society between Northern Ireland and Ireland as well. So it is, it's a cross border, so Cavan is one of, one of the chapters in the project. Um, so I have information left down on the desk below. If people are interested, they can register and um, you can email sarah at irishwarlink.ie if you want any more information. And for those of you that came from Belfast, it's relevant to you as well, the peace yeah. funding. There's a lot of information there that I need you guys to take. We talk about it later. And you can actually source, I can give you access to, to get more information if you need to know it. This is important for us as women that want to get their trading and it's coming into the rural environment and thinking of investing into politics as well. Um, there's a lot of resources if you're just starting your business, you're thinking of uh, microfinancing, thinking of how do I do it, how do you do your accounting, your tax returns, all those little things that you have to pay a lot of money to get people to do. This has offered of us a lot of um, um, free information, training that you can go through. And even organizations that are starting up as well, you get most of those information there. Um, thank you very much. I'm not stopping you. We're going to ask the question later on. Thank you very much, Louise. Um, yeah. Is that the last slide? It seems so. Yeah, but there's a few more just on, uh, we also provide free computer training as well. Okay. So it's a five week course. The basic computer training, so just um, you know, getting online and setting up email and going working through you know government services that are, are they're all moving online now, so how to access them and, and kind yeah, and if you like, if you're, yeah, if you're planning up events and you're looking for information regarding your TDs and everything, you can always source that. And if you're trying to learn a little bit about to use the use of your computers, because sometimes we think some of us don't really know how to use those computers to source information that we really need. Uh, that is the purpose of the training. It allows you to source relevant information to whatever you're doing. Thank you very much. We're going to ask you the questions later on. I know there's a lot of people that would like to ask you a round of applause. So can we all give a round of applause again for our keynote speaker? Now Tolubani. Yeah. <laughs> now thank you very, very much. She came all the way from Kil Kil is it Kilkenny or yeah. Is it Kilkenny or Yeah <laughs> So she came all the way, you know, travel. She walks overseas and she actually actually came down there. Um that is our college over there. So look if you're thinking Africans, what are they really doing here in Ireland? We're doing a lot. We're doing a lot. Uh, I, there's two people that were supposed to be here today, apart from her. She couldn't make it. She's traveling. She'll be arriving this evening. She realized her ticket was changed to evening. She also has a school here, the Northern East uh, College, which is led by an, Afri Evelyn, uh, an African person. Uh, she's a tutor in that school. She started as a tutor there, because I remember there was, she, she was doing that. But now she's part of the board that uh, actually owns uh, part of the board of directors for the school itself. Um, so we are really, really do, and I have to tap into your knowledge because I'm, my line is education. And I was saying to someone, I said, I have to come and sit with you, sit with her, and see. You guys should show me the way of starting up because I'm ambitious. 
and I really love to do that. So now I'm to loop them over. Let's give her a round of applause again, everyone. Um, I thought she was going to be staying over, so I, she, because she's a speaker, no speaker, she was meant to speak last. Um, sorry for that. But now she decided she didn't book in her to stay. Mm, so, <laughs> um, do you need the PowerPoint? Are you going to? Okay, good. So, I'm going to just read a little bit about her. Um, now, I'm not going to pronounce her surname. I told her I was supposed to ask her before this time, so she can teach me how to pronounce it. But she's going to tell us about it. This is what I'm saying. So she has MBA, she has NCIPD, uh, she's a minister, she has MLTD, she's the CEO of the whole of the uh, Rogate College, which is an e learning college which offers global recognized accredited programs to equip learners with knowledge and skills to deliver value. So Luwani is a member of the Leadership Academy. Uh, founder president of the Inspired Women Network. She's the CEO and the principal consultant at the Vintage, the major leadership and people development. Also, she studies a master's in business administration at the University of Wales. Somebody was talking about Wales here today? Yeah? <laughs> um, yeah, you're talking about Wales. Uh, St. David and study a PhD e research and technology enhanced learning at the Lashenstar Lash University. So let's give her a round of applause. It's been a very, very um, informative day. It's been a lovely day. I've learned quite a lot. I've been encouraged. I've been challenged, you know, and it's just been, I'm really glad that I came, even though it's going to be a three hour plus journey home, but that's fine. <laughs> I live in Kilkenny. And I've lived in Kilkenny for um, going to, I think, um, about 17 plus years yeah. now. So I'm a native now. Uh, it's a pleasure to be here. My name is Toluwani Akahome. Akahome means, it's, it, my husband is Isham oh. from Edo State. <laughs> and it means when I speak, people listen. <laughs> <laughs> and Toluwani means this one, is actually Toluwani means this one belongs to God. So thank you very much for uh, having me here, um, Mrs. Kumalafe, it's been um, it's been something I've been looking forward to. I've yeah, seen old faces here, and I've made new friends, and um, I've really been inspired. Uh, just a little bit about myself, in addition to what she has said, I am a wife and a mother, which is for me the two biggest jobs that I have. Every other thing is secondary to the fact that I'm a wife and I'm a, I'm a mother. I have. Uh, some of my children here, bar one, actually have four. Right. So um, the little one decided not to come at the last minute. But um, I'm very happy to have my children. I take them uh, everywhere I go, as many as I can, because they are my disciples, my first disciples. <laughs> so I want them to see what it's like, you know, to see what I do and what it's like to mix with other Africans and just, you know, be in that space so that they can be inspired as well. So I'm also a leader. I, I lead a community of uh, believers in Kilkenny, and I also lead women. I run the Inspire Women's Network, and it's really a platform where we, where I personally mentor women and um, mentor um, women leaders, aspiring leaders, and uh, entrepreneurs. And that's because uh, my focus mainly at this time is on women of color, and that's because we do not see as many of us in leadership positions as we should see. And we don't see as many of us in entrepreneurship as we, sh we should see. So we want to support women of color to move into the space where there's more representation of our people in, in politics, in media, in government, or, uh, you know, everywhere, everywhere that people are actually stepping into and making a difference. And I'm privileged to Run. I started Rogate College. I'm the chief executive director of Rogate College, and Rogate College is uh, is an e-learning college. And what we do is that we offer undergraduate courses, postgraduate courses, and uh, professional courses. I actually have uh, our head of operations here, Dave. is a fantastic man. We actually did MBA together. Dave Ule is a wonderful friend. Apart from being a colleague, he's a fantastic friend. Really um, been behind me all the way. 
So we offer uh, these courses to people who are ready to hit the ground running. And a lot of our focus is on emerging uh, economies of sub-Saharan Africa, where they're, they're English speaking. And that's because if you come from where we are coming from, there's such a gap in quality education. You know, and we want to help women and men, especially women, return to education. You know, because a lot of them would have um, gone to school and then started, you know, bearing children and nurturing, and then you just lose confidence and you just don't want to go on anymore. So we're hoping that you know we can tap more, not just into the Irish community. Of course, we offer our courses to um, in, in the UK and Ireland, but also to those in sub-Saharan Africa, emerging economies, speaking English, where we can help them to accelerate their own success. Okay, so that is what Rogue College is about. We started in 2016. Um, and um, we're just you know, trying to push forward and get as many students as we can on board. And I also um, manage um, Vantage Dimensions. Um, as a management consultant, my focus is really on leadership and people development. And as a result of what we do in Vantage Dimensions, we are able to help people increase their productivity by at least 20%. And that is by focusing on helping them build and develop and implement high performance skills. So we use a lot of tools like facilitation and coaching, mentoring, you know, providing that support where people are able to move from where they are in the organization or in their teams or as individuals from where they are to where they should be. Okay. And I suppose that is my life's purpose to help people, you know, move from where they are to where they should be. And I'm really excited, you know, to be in this summit because it's about women. Not just about women, but even women and their allies. And I'm thankful for the men that are still here today because women cannot really come off the point where we should be without people supporting us, our allies. Okay? And if you see, if you, if you have noticed that there's an unprecedented uh, global focus on women and on women leadership, and this is the time for us, we are at the forefront of the attention. And if you also notice, there is a shift. There is, there's, a, there's a shift, you know, in, and I want to call it a spiritual shift, okay, to women. So not just, the, 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 not just, a, just that global focus on the natural, but also a spiritual shift. Because there's something about what women do in the community. And we, women of color, have to understand who we are and the value that we bring. And a lot of times, and that's been my experience, and I'll just tell you a little bit how I got, I got into entrepreneurship. I had done, I, I had actually, I was a broadcaster at home. I had worked in radio and TV and other places that I worked, but my major was in, in, in radio and TV. And I'd come to Ireland, do you know how it is with our story? You come, you try to do this and do that. And I actually did the Irish Living Cert, just because I was trying to find my feet. And I remember that time, um, I had done this and done that, and I, I wanted to go on a CE scheme, a community employment scheme. And I, you know, there was this job that I applied for, and I thought, okay, this is it. I mean, I have the qualifications and all that. And the CEO actually uh, interviewed me. And I thought it went really brilliantly. But after about a week, I didn't hear anything from them. So I <coughs> rang the FOSS, it was FOSS at that time. The FOSS supervisor said, you know, I haven't, I didn't hear anything. And I know till today, this was 2008, but I know till today where I was standing, you know what I was doing. I had my three. I hadn't had the, my six-year-old then, of course, two thousand eight. And I remember that he said, "Yes, Tolwani, you know, uh, yes, you, yeah, it was good interview, but um, she, the, the, the CEO said she didn't think their clients would like your voice on the phone." And right there, and this is a true story. I mean, I wouldn't forget this. And, th and th I'm not saying that because I'm looking for. This is the reality. And right there, this was McDonald Junction. We just opened McDonald Junction in Kikena that time. I just started crying right there. I just broke down like, oh, I can't do this anymore. I'm tired. And I rang again, you know, kind of, okay, maybe I didn't hear that. You know, and I rang the man back. You know, what did you say she said? And he said the same thing. She didn't think their clients would like your voice on the phone. And I said to him, I actually find me a bit aggressive myself. We talked a little bit about it. And that, I, I, I just went home. I was tired. I was tired of pushing, you know. And I'm quite driven, but I was at that point really tired. But I, people said to me, I said to some people, they said, look, it's discrimination, you must do this. And I said, look, I know the things I can do and I, I should do. 
But I also realize that my children live in this community, you know, and I have to pick my battles. So I said, after about a month, I said, I'll go to her and actually find out why, you know, how they interview me, because I wanted closure. And um, I went to her, I remember where we were standing to today, you know, and uh, she said, hmm, you know, yes, it went well, it did, I couldn't fault you, but it was just something you didn't have, it was just something you didn't have. And that was it. That was the only thing she told me. But because I'm a spirit-filled person, and because I'm a Nigerian, I can't help but say that, I, I just decided, look, I have what it takes to start something by myself. And that's how my business was born. That's how Excuse Me Communication was born. You know, and that's how I started, I started pushing, you know, going from one organization to the other, selling myself, selling the agencies. And I, I remember also that I, I, I was, I started a first PhD then in 2014. And I, I was lecturing as well. It was a scholarship because I got a first in my master's, so I was into getting a scholarship. It was a really good um, opportunity. And I was wearing this tag, you know, really feeling cool. And here was this person that said, Oh, Tanwani, look, there's this person I want you to meet. And guess who was? This same person. Oh. <laughs> you know, and I had a moment to gloat, but, you know, I forgot to say, you just stay in your space, you know. So, um, that was how I began, that's how I started my business. And that's just to say to us, look, we have a lot to give as people of color, especially as women of color, but sometimes circumstances start against us. But in, see, we have to push against that. Okay? We have to stand strong and be resilient because we know who we are and we know what we've got. But these things happen and they're just for a short time, you know, and it, it actually helps you to see the kind of person that you really are and how far you can go with your dreams. And so this is a time for people in Ireland to feel the impact of what we are and who we are and what we bring. And that is why they're asking me about personal development because that for me is a big thing. Because the, as, the, as the world has shifted their focus on women and we're looking for allies, women and their allies to help us bring us into where we should be. Because no matter how much we try, and even thinking about family, you know, I have a very supportive husband. I'm actually on a, a, a second PhD, not because I finished the first, but because, <laughs> be, but because things happen. Another round of discrimination and I was kicked out, okay? But that's another story for another day, you know. And I remember being kicked out and um, <laughs> I remember blowing up like that because of stress, because I just didn't know what to do. I remember for six months, I was like, where am I? I lost my confidence, I lost this, I lost that, but then I picked myself back up again. Okay? Uh, it's been a journey. But the truth is, this, I am proud to be a woman. I'm a proud even to be a woman of color. Because this is our time. Because what we, what this country needs, what this continent needs, what Africa needs is in us. And that's why I'm saying I'm thankful for the husband I have who supports me every single way. And we need those allies. We need those, we need our men. We need our men and the men in our lives to support us 100%. Because it's not about when you're achieving, when you're an achiever like we are, it's not about that you don't want to, you don't want to submit. Submission doesn't mean that you, 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 uh, you bow down your head and walk all over me. It's that I willingly come under your authority. Mm -hmm. And that's what it means. But we need we need our men to stand with us and support us. Because if they do not, if you don't, the society suffers. Our children suffer. Because we are the ones that have the most impact with the children. So if when the, the men do not see it as a threat, but they see us, you know, they see themselves as our support, our backbone, then we're able to achieve what we should. And the world will hear about us. This is the time. So how do we, as women of color, and I don't want to call it black and white. You know why I don't want to call it black and white? And I'll tell you, just this quick joke. Uh, I was just doing some research and, uh, excuse me, I, I just, it was, uh, I'm doing a course in digital marketing, and I was talking about whitelist. And I, and, and I said, whitelist, it didn't strike me, whitelist. That's one you select out of a whole lot. Then I said, blacklist, that's the one you deselect. 
what? So I just said, no. Either I'm a, a melanated woman, a woman of <laughs> whatever you call it, but not that. But anyway, that's an aside. So this is a time for us to step into the position of leadership. That's what the world is calling us to. Leadership. Leadership in the home. First, self-leadership. We lead ourselves. We step in a place where you, you challenge yourself to be the best you could ever be. And then you're able to lead others, starting from the children. And then we move on. And so it is time first begin to discover and rediscover ourselves. You know, rediscover who you are. Because every time that you face a challenge, you discover something new about yourself. Every time that something happens, you discover who you really are. And you continue to grow. It's a time for us to continue to grow because when opportunity that is coming comes, we must be prepared. So this is a time for us women to be prepared because opportunity is coming for women of color, but the preparation has to be now. So discover and rediscover yourself. Commit yourself to ongoing development, growth. Yeah, and now position yourself. This is part of our positioning. So I've met people today that I, I know are going to bring me forward in my journey. So this is part of the position. Position yourself. Discover and rediscover. Yeah. Grow yourself. Ongoing growth. You must never stop. And that has to come with evaluating yourself constantly. Where am I? Where am I? Where should I be? Where am I going? And then continue to position and reposition yourself every single time. And then we hit it. Opportunities coming. Thank you. thank you very much. Oh, thank you so much. Can you give me a big hug? Thank you so much. I I'll tell you, you know, she talks about the story about looking for a job. I had the similar experience here in Cabin. Um, I was looking, uh, I started, we have a local radio, and I was part of the board of uh, the starting of the radio, radio, uh, the community radio. We got the funding, uh, we're looking for an administrator, and they were looking for a coordinator. So the administrator is a part time job, it's a lower requirement, and I'm supposed to be part of the people that I interview. So I talked to the board because I was the chair, vice chairperson for the board. I said, Look, I'd like to go for this position to apply for it. I have all the experience in it, more than the experience in it anyway. Um, I have it. Um, I said, but I'd like to apply for it. Oh, they said, okay, fine. So then I, I have to step down from the board because they are, we are the ones doing the interview. So I've spoken to them about it and everything. And then I submit my CV, did everything, do everything. And then you can't believe. Now, I, cho I purposely chose to go for the admin because the coordinator is a full-time job. Um, I think the requirements, I, I beat all the requirements anyway. It's just uh, having your uh, level, school start level, that was what they were looking. I already have masters in being, I'm on my masters already. So, and then they're looking for someone that have experience in radio. I had the experience already. We did the training together, even when we were setting up the training. So I felt that I have everything, but I didn't want to go for the higher position. So let me just go for the lower one. At least to give them the chance to put somebody which is in our person in the higher position. So I'm happy enough with that. They never called me for the interview. Now, I will tell you one thing. For months in this cabin, I was carrying my CV everywhere. I was taken to every single person. I was like going mad. I said, with the CV, with the requirements. With the CV, with the requirements. Then I spoke to them. They said, why did I get the job? So they said, oh, they said, oh uh, my English is a problem. <laughs> they might not be able to understand me. That was the same excuse they gave me. Then I asked them, I said, I spoke to one of them, which I know them very well. I said, but we've been in the board together. We've been having meetings together. We've attained training together. Don't you understand me when I speak? Oh, she said, <laughs> I said, but you guys didn't even call me for the interview. How was, I said, is that why I joined the community? I said, no, I didn't join. I said, we put together for this funding. I didn't join it because of that. But when the opportunity was there, why wouldn't I take into it? We're all taking the opportunity. She was also the coordinator of the community fund, so why can't I take it? So I can feel what you feel, baby. I can feel it. Um, and I'll tell you, even with this project today, and I was saying it, it was yesterday that we got the confirmation. So as we, as women and as people within the migrant community, be who you are. Don't change yourself for anything. I will change myself for anything. And I will advise you, but like she said, develop yourself. Check yourself, because you, you might think you're, you're, what you're doing is right. 
Always check yourself and see, am I doing it right? Am I saying the right thing? Am I positive? If, if there's reason for you to do something, change it. Now, I'm not going to take over, but I need you guys to tell me, do you have a question for her? Because we have an entertainment at the back. Do we have a question for her? You have to ask that question. You need to talk to her. You, because I'm going to link with her. I'm going to be drawing her like this. She's like a sister. You know? But still, I'm going to like, okay, come here, baby. Teach me how you're doing it. Because the only way you can learn is to be able to accept other people. You don't think it's not it's not nothing to do with age differences. It doesn't have anything to do with what you have. What matters most is that when you see people in position of power, respect them for where they are. And that is the only way you can learn from them. Is for you to be submitting to them to say, okay. And like she said, submitting is not as if you are giving up your total right. It's saying that, oh, you have something to give me. I want to learn from it. So let us tap into it. So do we have a question? Because there's a lady that came all the way to dance for us. And she's waiting. So we need to ask the question. You need to ask. Ask her how did she do it? Anyway, she's tell us some of it. But tell her how did she do it? How did she position herself? And that, like I said in the beginning, and this is the purpose of this conference, is for us to start positioning ourselves in a place of power. Now, Rose, you're going to wait a moment because these people came all the way from Belfast and they want to share something very small with us. So I'm going to get them to just talk for two minutes to learn. Do you want to represent? Um, yeah, go on to that. Let's give her a round of applause, please, everybody. And if you need to talk to her, please make sure you take her details and talk to her. If you're thinking of doing furthering your education, register with our online school. Thank you. Just two minutes, yeah. Good evening, ladies and gentlemen. I'm very happy to be here. And I really appreciate the support of uh, some of our there. My name is Ismail Sule. I'm a medical microbiologist and I've been working with NHS in Belfast since 2000. As an African man and a Yoruba man, particularly. Want to borrow, I want to borrow a statement from Mrs. Akiume. Yeah, Akau. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> we have a box to give to African community. Let's find the fact that this submit is for only women. I really associate yes. my association. Because of the fact that I came from the West Africa country, and as a biomedical scientist, I decided to form Sickle Cell Foundation. And the reason why I formed it was that, not because of the fact that uh, we are lacking behind. The main reason was that, the main reason why I formed it was, I was thinking of, okay, what can I give back to my community back home? I don't have money, I don't have employment, and I don't have job, and so on. So we decided to call ourselves, all African practitioners, in the NHF Trust. Um, at the end of the day, we conclude to form the organization. So the main purpose of forming it is to go back to Africa to do sickle cell screening free for the students. And the main reason why we target students was that because in Nigeria, particularly, we don't have a national newborn screening. So we decided to intervene at the secondary level of the student. So, so far, so good. We started in two, uh, 2015. We've been to Oshun State. We've been to Ogun State. We've been to Lagos State. That's my hometown. Okay. Maybe I will leave my uh, website address. Maybe anytime you think you want us to visit your village, we will also do. And anytime we go to Nigeria, we don't speak English. We speak our dialects because of we want the student to understand the reason why we came to help them. We speak in dialect, we explain the importance of sickle cell to them, and we explain the implication of knowing your genotype. And we also explain the reason why you should make informed choices before you reach reproductive age. And that is the only method we can use to prevent sickle cell in our society. Because in most cases, if you think properly, in most cases, most of the funding goes for cancer and other important genetics in Western world. But in Africa, there was no much fun on sickle cell, and the only way we can reduce it is to know your genotype status in order to prevent it. Thank you very much. I appreciate coming here.
Okay. Now, our website. yes. Now they are going to leave some of their cards at the back. Please, I need you to pick up those cards. They are, just give me a moment. Don't go yet. Uh, Mrs. I call you, uh, Toluani. Please, don't go. I need to take a picture with you. You can, and you have to take with us, please, please, because that picture might bring me money. Um, <laughs> she's not going. She's at the back. Yeah. So now we have this beautiful lady. She she came all the way to come and perform this dance to us. Her name is Rose. Having me all the signs that I stay behind. Um, thank you very much, and uh, I really appreciate it. Yeah. Okay. So music. Let's enjoy the dance. Oh, 
Okay, yeah, that's it. So we can get you guys all to hold the books and then we put it back. We should, we should have done that actually. Can I get someone to check for them? Yeah. Yes, mom. You want to bring Oh my God,